from you? Yes, I have some images it will that put it up. I have to, it I It will guess, pop up in a moment. I think it'll pop up. Um, I don't know if people in the room can appreciate my situation because I've been a user of the internet for 50 years. When I started using it, it wasn't called the internet, but there were only 100 people on it and I knew them all. And what I didn't know at the time was that this was gonna become like air, something that you would only notice if it was missing. And that you would take it for granted, which we did, some of us, for the next 50 years. And then as I became more and more involved, starting about 30 years ago, with the developing world, I started to feel that this is so fundamental, which we all agree now, but it's kind of amazing how we have moved as a society. So I am going to be relatively extreme in my remarks. I'm not going to ask you to believe or agree with everything, but I think we're at a period in history where the private sector has to now get out of the way and governments have to get out of the way. And so I'm gonna talk about internet connectivity as a human right, but I'm gonna talk about it in a way that is very different. First of all, worldwide is important as a concept. Free is important. It's not free to society, but it's free to the individual. Now, whether that's a civic right, like street lamps are free, or whether it's a human right in a deeper sense uh, of freedom, doesn't really concern me too much, but the concept of free is very different than the concept of low cost. I hear the word low cost and affordable. Well, I don't hear that word when it comes to the rights that we normally think of as human rights. Oh, this is a human right, and by the way, it's affordable. Well, that's not a, an appropriate word. And then the concept of a global public sector is basically the definition of the United Nations, but in all due respect, the United Nations is a very easily criticized organization for various reasons, but that's all we've got. We don't have anything else. So I think in terms of the public sector. So I also wake up in the morning and ask myself one question, and I hope this audience, this group does it, we do it as a group. What will market forces not do today? Because market forces will do many things, and I'm not trying to stop them. I'm trying to suggest there are some things market forces don't do that we should be doing. And to think very, very hard about the difference between a mission, which is what I think we're on, and a market. And they get confused, and people try to make markets more mission-oriented, and they try to do well while doing good. That's a very common phrase these days, and I think that is, again, not appropriate here. So by way of background, I think of telecommunications as something that has grown up like tobacco and alcohol. Now, I have been through, again, over 50 years of telecommunications development, and those of you who followed, in particularly in developing countries, the people who made long distance phone calls were deemed to be so rich that we could charge them an exorbitant amount to pay for local co phone calls or universal access. And then something very interesting happened in history that people don't remember. The historical coincidence of privatization and wireless. And Europe, in the 1980s, particularly near the end of the 80s, used wireless to privatize, which was fine. I'm not complaining about the, about the historical coincidence, but people then said, well, let's have the business sector come in. We don't like monopolies, so we'll create duopolies and more on some occasions, and we'll privatize, and things changed very dramatically. It used to take three years to get a telephone in Italy before that. You used to pay $5,000 down in some countries and it would take forever. So that coincidence of privatization and wireless is a very important one because 
a lot has advanced and it's been claimed because of the privatization and I think that's a false, a false uh, association. And I want to say one more thing about the privatization that occurred at that point. Since it was wireless, you needed spectrum. And spectrums, spectrum was auctioned by countries. And the auctioning of spectrum, I will claim, is an immoral concept. That the state takes something owned by the people and puts it up for auction at very large amounts of money, so large that whoever buys it has to carry that cost forward to the consumers, to the users. And the cost has become onerous, and the concept is, needs some revisiting. So we're always told the private sector is more efficient than the public sector. Well, you're going to hear today an example where that's not true. You've all been on trains in Switzerland. There are many examples of where the public sector can do things. It's not, particularly in the United States, a country that as an American I'm deeply embarrassed to be from it because of our current ignorant president, but it's a, he is bringing with him an even bigger swing in the wrong direction. So we have to look at the public sector differently. And I say, is it? And I will point to Uruguay and let my colleague Miguel Brechner explain what's happening there because it's an amazing role model. It's a, there are other places too, but it's a particularly interesting one that I believe the world should copy. So here are the goals that I, I put forward, um, and they're based very often on children being the most precious natural resource of a country. I cannot tell you how many heads of state I have used that sentence with who look at me as if there were a deer in the headlights. They look and they say, my God, I never thought of that. I think of oil, I think of diamonds, I think of wheat, food, but children as a natural resource. It's not limited to children. But in 1982 was the first time I brought the internet uh, and connectivity and laptops to uh, the developing country. And I learned one thing. The one thing I learned in 82 is that those children who did not speak a word of English or French played that keyboard like a piano. There was no difference between them and the suburban kids outside of New York, Boston, or Paris. It was, it was just kind. Then in 2001, almost 20 years later, um, I was able to, by chance, go to villages that had a per capita income, annual per capita income, of less than $30. And connect those kids and, and give them all laptops. And this was a very early experiment and it completely transformed the village and every single kid in that picture, every single one went on to university. What, whereas usually the village had zero. And when people asked me, what, what line of nonprofit business are you in? My answer was, I'm in the business of hope. Those children had hope. They had hope in such a way that, would, and when they brought those laptops home and opened them up, the light of the screen was the only light in the house. Talk about metaphors and reality. To me, it was very, very jarring. So I started it with, with the UN. I won't, I'm only gonna show you pictures, not because you all should get a tour of one laptop per child, but it was an experiment. It had many failings, but it's an experiment that proved to me that the kids are the vehicles. And I look at this particular picture. I have no idea who takes the pictures, by the way. They're sent to me. I have no particular, I can't associate it with somebody. But look at the concentration of that young girl's face. And I just wonder, sort of, don't know what she's doing today. Um, but normally school and learning are not with that kind of focus and attention and fascination. And then Matt Keller later will tell you some of the 
some of the things that were done, but this is the best picture. I've never had a picture like this. Okay, the kid on the right has nominated himself teacher. There are no teachers in this village. There's no print matters, there's no book. But look at the kids using their tablet. The one on the left is touching the tablet, the kid next to and that kid is to Talk about collaboration. Usually these go into schools and everybody does the same thing at the same time. The teacher says one, two, three, and the kids go one, two, three. They use the laptops. This is totally different. They created the idea of having a place that they would go to. There isn't a place called school. So you'll hear more about this later. This is in Ethiopia. There were two places, one in the north, one in the south. Um, and they were chosen because there was no literacy in the village. There was no occurrence of words. There were no signs. There were no magazines. There were no letters. The kids, parents, everybody in the village was illiterate. Uh, and that was the reason it was chosen. And a whole thing has emerged out of it, which you will hear a lot about today. And then the kids started giving press conferences, which was a disappointment because helicopters were flying in, but at any rate. So pictures like this, to me, are, are wonderful pictures, but they sort of show, to me, the hope, the hope business. So this really is not the next 1.5 billion people. It's the last 1.5 billion people. The next 1.5 is a piece of cake. You can do that by changing some pricing, some regulation. It's no effort whatsoever. You could add 1.5 billion people to the internet almost tomorrow. The last 1.5 billion is a very interesting problem because it's a technical problem. The people who would be in that group, they're illiterate, they're remote, they're, there's just many, many problems and technically they're the ones that interest me, but uh, sort of the solutions really are about them. So I'm going to take two minutes and just give you some of what I think are the solutions above and beyond just the imperative. If this meeting creates the imperative to make connectivity a human right, it will be a landmark. It'll be like Bretton Woods was to economics. It'll be like the Dartmouth meeting in 1958 where six people met and they coined the term AI. And boom, it took 50 years more for AI to become what it became today, but it was a pivotal, pivotal point, and I think we can be that too. So global advocacy is a piece of the solution. It's what I think this meeting does. If people hear that the Pontifical Academy, that the UN Women, that the UN Human Rights, that, that groups like that have come together under the aegis of, amongst others, pre President Prodi, to basically push this concept, that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. The second thing is I think, and now this is my opinion, my opinion is we should create a global agency. I call it the World Connectivity Organization. How that happens, ways it happens, is that what it's called? But it's, it, there isn't one now. There is nobody. Nobody at the UN, nobody anywhere who believes their mission is to connect the world. And there should be. And then one, and the last one that I think is important only because it's the one I know how to do, it's when you create a plausible solution, people pay attention. With one laptop per child, what nobody knows about one laptop per child, and we have the king in the back, the Zamora family, who are doing one laptop per child, and, and Breckner, who did by far the most extensive and exhaustive job, is it got other people to move. And after we did three million laptops, I went first to President Lula, and I said to President Lula, bid. Create a bid, a number, and then we'll bid on it. We'll bid on it publicly. So when there's a tender for a million laptops, we bid openly. We published it in the newspaper, and we published whatever it was, $182 
50 cents. We had credibility because we had done three million. And guess what? The winner won it for $179. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I don't want to really make laptops, but if I could keep putting in a bid that forces everybody down, and we did 50 million laptops that way. 50 million that got into the hands of kids in many countries, not because we were making them, but because we had a plausible solution that pushed it way down. And then outside of the national jurisdiction, I think is important for two reasons, and then I'll stop. Two reasons, one is you can't go country by country by country. Whether you think there are 196 or 198 or whatever number of countries, it's almost 200. You can't possibly go to all 200 countries and have them all agree that this is the way they're gonna do it. So fortunately, and this is a very wonderful piece of uh, f good fortune, the jurisdiction of countries stops at 100 miles. There's a different body of law. That's why we have all sorts of things happening at a certain height. So if you could in some way get the global telecommunications scheme outside the jurisdiction of countries, namely above 100 miles, you will be doing something that no country has to agree to. Let them outlaw it. Let them make it illegal. They don't give you landing rights. So what? It's there. And if somebody builds a little tinfoil receiver that can receive and send 10 megabits per second, they'll do that in the jungles. The country will even sanction it in remote areas. So. We have, for the first time, I'm a personally interested in low Earth orbiting satellites. They can be fixed. But one of the interesting things about orbiting satellites is it's the first time in history that there is a geometry that is itself global. That satellite has to go around the world. That's the way it works. It can't stop over someplace. It has to keep going. So if it keeps going, let it keep working. So you could actually have a global footprint that is global by, by its nature, not because we built thousands and thousands of them. It's a very, very different world. And I believe, not I believe, I know, sorry, I, I know you can do it for, that's the 10 billion number is the 0.01 percent, by the way. So it's, that's where, versus quite a bit higher, the 450 billion is a number that the telecommunications companies today believe they have to spend in the next five years to enhance terrestrial uh, communication. Uh, yeah, to enhance terrestrial. And just as a last remark, um, I happen to believe that very modest connectivity is just fine. It does not have to be broadband, and we can argue about that. But, uh, so I'll end with just a little note that we keep forgetting in the United States. The United States is a rounding error. The United States is almost an irrelevant rounding error in the population of the world. We are 0.3 out of 7.5 billion people. So, this is not a United States issue. The United States shouldn't be running it or doing it. It's really a world problem of which the United States is a very, very small piece. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, especially also raising examples and points for solutions. Uh, we have only 